sad day for me uh, because I learned that a friend of mine, Chris Treadway, uh, passed away. Uh, someone I, I hadn't seen in some time, and, um, but was, played a very important role in my life. Uh, Chris uh, was the person that launched, essentially launched me into the media space, as, as people would say now in the vernacular. Um, and what happened was, well, the story has to be told act properly, so here he goes. I was on the Alameda Base Reuse Committee. I was placed there by then Alameda County Supervisor, who is now Alameda C County Supervisor Keith Carson. And um, he had as his chief of staff, uh, Dexter Roberson and then Amalia Egri as his aide. And Amalia and I became fast friends. And I was complaining about how I felt that there were consultants who were on the base reuse committee who didn't really care about the needs of the uh, people. More, they were trying to simply line themselves up to, well, get consulting work. Um, it's the way it goes, okay? But they were kind of making it too obvious. And Corby Engineering in particular, just to name names, was really uh, a violator. <laughs> so I wanted to write about it. I talked to Amalia about it. Amalia agreed with me. And she said, here's what you do. Have you ever written for a newspaper? I said, no, I have no idea. My background is urban planning. This was 1993. I graduated from Cal's city planning program in 87. I started working at the Oakland Redevelopment Agency, the Office of Economic Development and Employment in that same year. They rehired me, they hired me as an intern, rehired me as a consultant because a computer model that I built that could be applied to redevelopment projects in up and down the state of California uh, in, eight, in 88. And then I started my own economic consulting business in 89. Uh, and got the redevelopment agency of Emeryville as my first client under my friend Kofi Barner, who I graduated from Cal with. So I was planning, 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 planning. And the idea of working for a news organization never entered my mind. Uh, so here I am talking to Molly about it. And I say, well, how do I go about this? She says, well, write four query letters. No, write, well, excuse me, write four samples and one query letter, write one to the Tribune, where Pearl Stewart was the editor, but then she said, don't stop there, write one to the Montclarian, and Chris Treadway is the editor there. And she said she put in a good word for me. Now, my background at the time was, uh, was the, uh, and Vision says, love, Vision, I have to read this comment, Vision says, oh no, I love that guy, I follow him on Flitter, Flickr and Twitter, uh, it's a total shame. He was a great man. I didn't know him at all, but I enjoyed his sharings online for years. Yeah. Uh, anyway, what happened was that I remember Chris, um, yeah, definitely rest in peace. Thanks, thanks Jack. I uh, haven't seen you in quite a while, by the way. Uh, anyway, Chris, I talked to Chris. I called Chris, and then I called Paul Pearl, and Pearl said, send me something or whatever. Um, and... I didn't hear from her. I didn't hear from Chris for a little bit. Then I remember walking down Grand Avenue, um, and I happened to be walking on the same side of the street as a consignment shop called Second to None, which is located now where Wine Bar is, uh, which is actually near the corner of Grand and Elwood. Anyway, I saw Pearl, and I was waiting. Hey, Pearl! Hey, Pearl! Hey, Pearl! And rather than say, oh, hey, Zinni, I got your you know, material, and here's my thought, she just... She quite literally ran away from me, ducked right into second and into none. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to pursue her into that place. That would look too obvious. And so I just didn't, you know. Um, and I just simply put it out of my mind. I thought, and I was disappointed primarily because Pearl was black. And I thought, hey, perhaps uh, she would open the door and all that. Not that I necessarily had an idea. I wanted to, I had observations I wanted to share, not just from the being on the base reuse committee, 
but from having worked for the Oakland Redevelopment Agency as an intern and built a computer model that no one else in the state had ever had or knew, knew, knew could be done uh, from a spreadsheet. I had a lot to, to share. So Chris and I had a meeting and he said, I'm going to give you a crucible within which to learn the craft of writing. That's how you put it. And um, that's precisely what he did. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I was there from 19, October 16th of 1993 to October 13th of 1996. And we had a lot of highs. Um, and among them was that, according to Marty Poole, who was then a uh, columnist for the Oakland Tribune and friend, still know him to this day, I'll never heard from him, but Monty told everyone it was me who broke the story that the Raiders were coming back from LA to Oakland. And I thought that was very nice of him to just honestly put that out there. I wasn't saying that. I was so busy at working my sources, as I now say, and um, bird dogging the, the matter of what was happening with uh, the Raiders that it didn't occur to me. The, I uh, had befriended Al Casal, who was Al Davis' right hand at the time, as well as Mike Taylor, who is Raiders PR guy, who's still with the Raiders now, the Will Kiss is the PR guy. Um, but I did all that with the Montclarian. And what I learned from Chris was brevity. Because in the pre-internet Berkeley years, uh, one thing everyone at Cal did, and still does, really, is talk fast. And you have to have gone to Cal to understand what I mean. I mean, we talk a mile a minute. And if you think I'm talking fast now, I am not. This is space normal speed. But you come out of Cal, you're at warp speed because you're dealing with so many bright people. It's not that you have to keep up or anything. It's just the way that it is, okay? Chris taught me, who was also, you know, um, spawned from that earlier. And we both went, to, both went to Skyline High School. He was graduated of, I think, class of 60, uh, excuse me, class of uh, 73. I'm class of 80. Tom Hanks is class of 74. Anyway, uh, but Chris taught me how to express c complex ideas in a simple way. Because I'm good at, I was good at pedantry and good at complex ideas and system dynamics and all that. I could take those complex ideas and explain them, but I explain them in a way that will put you to sleep. And you would say, what? As opposed to just getting right to the point. Chris also taught me just how to break up my paragraphs. So then you've got like four different ideas here. Break them up, right? Break up my paragraphs. He then made absolutely certain that I wrote for length, but not too long. Because my problem was that I would have these long paragraphs, but, right? But I'd have these long paragraphs, which lead, led to these long columns. But he would say, well, you know, shorten your paragraphs, cut them up, and then we have a lot to say, then you can pour them out more, right? So in other words, it's, it's the efficiency of words so then when you're using the words, it actually has meaning. Does that make sense? Learn that too. Haven't forgot it. Um, so another high was when, just because one thing, just to be absolutely blunt about what was going on at the time, the Montclarian was considered the White Hills News publication, okay? So for the Montclarian to bring in someone black, it just shocked everybody. Flatlands, Hills, all over the place. And in those days, newspapers mattered. They didn't compete for your attention with, you know, online material. Uh, we had just started by, I think, the second year that I was there, uploading my columns from my computer to the Montclarian so they could be printed. But we still were not online. That was still a brand new, that was a brand new concept. The, you know, the bandwidth just wasn't there. You know the drill, right? I, I believe. That wasn't there. 
so we what we so so the McLaren bringing a person like me in was a gigantic deal to a lot of people and my niche was to talk about redevelopment just like I do today I've tried to do with Howard Terminal all that uh, work that I've done in explaining redevelopment to people I did with a Montclarian when it mattered even more because redevelopment was active and I got to a point where in 1994 according to a number of people I vied with Peggy Stinnett of the Tribune for the most popular column in Oakland and Peggy turned out to be a great friend um, miss her a, a ton she gave me some great advice uh, she said because I asked her I said what makes a great columnist she said you have to be angry about something and Chris gave me the space to be that person I think the only rub uh, there were you know maybe it's a couple of rubs over a gigantic swath of good good times was race um, but not in a bad way. There were things I wanted to say in a certain way that Chris dialed me down. And I'm not complaining that he did. It was a good thing. Uh, I remember there was one particular establishment that I walked into. Won't mention the name at all. But I wanted to write the column to end all columns and blast them. And Chris said, you know, you might not want to do that because you might want to walk in there one day. And I became a regular there. Uh, he was absolutely right. They changed, but because of what Chris told me, I changed. In other words, I gave them another chance. Whereas, had I written the column, I would have burned a bridge that I didn't even know was there. Didn't even know it was there. And it was there. Uh... He also was very good about calling me about little details I might have missed about something he knew about, you know? And he was always had questions about redevelopment, about numbers and everything. Um, it was fun. He gave me enough room to have fun. But the greatest, I think the greatest achievement was when he and... Warren Chip Brown, the publisher, who was fellow, fellow Cal Bear, uh, we always used to talk about Cal um, a lot. And he, also T. Gary Rogers. But at any rate, who was Dryer's Ice Cream CEO at the time. Anyway, um, we, we, uh, he gave me the entire op ed page section. I mean, it's like big folks okay I don't have okay big for a 70 question survey of Oaklanders so you got the paper and in the middle of it was this survey and people filled it out and they sent it back 600 snail mail returns largest return of mail in the Montclarians history to that point very proud of that to this day. To learn about Oakland. What did I learn? Well, among other things, some, th some things obvious, but uh, others less so. For example, this was a write-in. This was question 41. And it was, excuse me, so not question 41, it's question 64. 64 was explain why you move, why you moved to Oakland. What's special about Oakland? Write it in. Six, uh, um, 70% of the people wrote in, handwrite, diversity. This is in 1994, folks, okay? They wrote in diversity. So Oakland has always been, think about this, 1994, 2004, 2014, we're headed to 2024, right? Diversity has always been in the lexicon of words that people have used to describe Oakland and be proud of it, diversity. And there were the questions that people were uneasy about. Question number 41 asked, if three black teenagers walking your direction, what would you do? And it gave you options. 
Unfortunately, the majority of people who answered the question answered they would go to the other side of the street. I was heartbroken. I got a lot of letters about that. People who were ashamed to admit it, but also talking about the crime of the day and expectations. Uh, it was a real eye-opening uh, question that led to a lot of conversation that uh, I take as a time in the bottom moment. It couldn't have happened without Chris, okay? It just couldn't. Uh, we also were right in the middle, because this goes back to the Raiders and the JPA and the Coliseum, and the late George Vukasin was a great friend. Uh, George gave me a great interview, and all this has got to be at the Oakland Public Library, by the way, a microfilm, but... George Vukasin, who was, you say, who was George? George was the CEO of Peerless Coffee, uh, the president of the Coliseum Board at the time. This was in the middle of the Raiders preparing either to move back to Oakland or Hollywood Park at the time. No one had any idea, right, where the Raiders were going to go. Um, he gave me a great interview in the Montclarian, so great that then new Oakland City Council president in Nacho De La Fuente, and this was in 1996, uh, excuse 95 going to 96, called me and goes, you know, Nacho's, I want equal time. So he got equal time. <laughs> and that's how it was in those days, you know. Uh, I remember we were all staunchly pro-Oakland. We didn't want to hear about something going on in San Francisco. We felt Oakland's downtown needed to be built up. I wrote that. Oakland's problem then was that it did not have enough moneyed white people in the downtown area. That's what I wrote. Um, and stuck to that. I came up with a concept called the soul of Oakland. And I would use the soul of Oakland. In other words, this, this imaginary, this character that would go around Oakland and either rejoice or lament the changes in Oakland. And boy, what would the soul of Oakland say today? You know? Um, that was done. We had, it got to a point where I walked down the street one day, like I walked down Piedmont, someone would say, Zinni, I love that column, or Zinni, a column was trash, or something like that. That's how people, that's how it was in those days, you know? You didn't have social media to write stuff about people and, and using an, uh, your, an anonymous you know, accounts or something like that. People were real. You know, if somebody liked you, you knew who liked you. If someone who didn't like you, you knew who they were, right? And more often than not, when you met them, uh, they were nice because their dislike was about a particular thing you wrote that maybe they didn't quite get, okay? But you could talk about it with a voice and you didn't have this two-dimensional plat thing online where you're only reading their words back and forth and so your insecurities take over. No, you talk to people then. It was better. Much better. Um, no, it really was. So Chris was in the... Chris started this. He really did. I think where things went wrong was... Well, I don't know. I, I think... Well, I do know. Um... I got, what happened was a column that I wrote said that then Oakland Mayor Elihu Harris favored Michael Baines to build old Oakland housing. And I saw the mayor for the first time, met him at a, an event I was invited to, a fundraiser for Wellington Webb, the, who was then the mayor of Denver. It was held at the Pritkin Mansion uh, in the mission in San Francisco, it's actually an, an antebellum style, southern style mansion plucked right in the middle of San Francisco in the mission district. Not where you can see it off the street, it's tucked away behind a building and there's these, these tweeping willows and you're there, right? So it was that place I saw Elihu with his chief of staff, Larry Reed. Yes, who was now, was now now former council member. And Elihu said, why'd you write that column? Why'd you write that column? And I didn't know what he was upset about. He was upset about that column because he said that I said that he favored a developer. And the bottom line is Elihu didn't know, and I followed up in a column that, hey, by the way, 
you have, there's like six different items of case law that say that an elected official can favor a developer uh, for a project, okay? And uh, that, that, that that's fact still exists to this day. Anyway, uh, Larry said, you know, two African-American men shouldn't be ag arguing. And I said, well, I didn't, you know, start it. He didn't. I was talking to Chris about it. Chris got a chuckle out of it. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think, I think partly Chris was probably hoping that I got beat up because it'd be good press. But <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> no, not really. He wasn't malicious like that. I'm, t I'm partially teasing. But he was amused. Anyway, um, Elihu and I, Elihu made me an offer to join his staff because he was, he said, well, you're a journalist. And I said, actually, I'm not. I'm, my background's in urban planning. Uh, I'm a consultant. And he goes, and so Elihu made me an offer to be his economic advisor. And I started, and I went to Chris about it. I said, Chris, um, I don't know if this is allowed. I would guess not. Uh, but Elihu's made me an offer to be his economic advisor. And, uh, and Chris, before I could finish my sentence, Treadway said, well, you know, all you have to do is put the bottom of your byline, because I didn't know about those things, right? He says, put at the bottom of your byline that you are Oak, the economic advisor and mayor of Oakland. So that's what I did. And um, we were cool for a year. But what happened was that Elihu pushed for something that had been the gleam in the eye of um, my mentor, who I also interviewed Richard Winnie, who I miss a ton, who passed away some years ago. Um, and uh, Dick Spies, who I also interviewed a, a bunch, who was our District 4 representative at the time. And it was strong, it was to have a, 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 a strong mayor form of government not as opposed to what we had then, which is council manager, because um, the mayor felt that he, he would always say, can you count to five votes? But he always felt he was hamstrung, particularly if the council didn't do something that he knew the voters wanted done, all right? And anyway, he had, it's called Measure F, uh, which probably sort of in retrospect had a different letter. But I wrote in favor of it. And there are people who are upset that me as a paid columnist, paid mayors, they would write in favor in the Montclarian. But look, everybody knew where I was coming from. But what happened was that T. Gary Rogers of Dryers threatened to pull, and Kaiser threatened to pull their ads if Chris and Chip did not shut me down. And so guess, okay, so that's, that was what happened there. I mean, I, they, I ran that one, but then the coup de gras, which really hurts to this day. Not That other one I can kind of sort of deal with maybe a little bit, but this other one really did uh, chafe my hide. And what happened was I had come into contact with a man by the name of Gary Webb, W-E-B-B, -B, Webb. Uh, Gary Webb wrote a book called Dark Alliance about the CIA's effort to run drugs through the inner cities to fund the Contra Revolution, okay? Uh, and <clears throat> I interviewed Gary, wrote about it, and it wound up being my last column for the Montclarian and was one that no one ever saw. They pulled it. Uh, I contacted Charlie Sumner, uh, who was our Alameda County Sheriff. I asked for permission to interview a guy named Renolfo Conejo, who was one of the kingpins, uh, masterminds of this, um, effort. And so I never got a chance to meet Mr. Conejo. Do you want to know how his name came back into my life years later? I happen to be here, where I'm in Georgia, you know, sitting with my mom here. Uh, I'm not sitting with her, she's not in this room, but she's downstairs, but you know, keeping her company uh, while I've um, been away from Oakland. And uh, reminds me of something I gotta take care of with respect to Oakland too, but whatever. 
Um, I happened to be watching a movie with Tom Cruise, which was a story based on what turned out to be Gary Webb's book, but so changed and so turned around, I didn't recognize it at first. And then in the middle of the movie, one of the people that Tom Cruise happened to be working with when it was, when, when he, who was also connected with the CIA, but the conscious was Renolfo Conerjo. I fell out of my chair. I fell out of my chair. So we, we didn't end on the best terms per se. It wasn't that Chris was upset with me. I was more upset with Chip that he did that, but it just left a bad taste, I think, uh, for me. Um, because we could have done something really path-breaking. In fairness to Chip and in fairness to Chris, more, more important, there were people who questioned Gary Webb's story. Um, he was not getting cooperation from the Mercury News. And he wound up dying at the age of 49 years old. I believe he committed suicide. Uh, but it was a story that Gary very much believed in and followed uh, that really got to the heart of how the CIA worked. So that was kind of the direction that I was headed in with what I was doing with the Montclarian. Um, on top of everything else, and my, my primary uh, habit of covering the council, uh, at that time, the city council was at the Lakeside Park Garden Center. Why? Because the Oakland City Hall was damaged by a Loma Prieta earthquake. That's why. So, Chris Treadway made, made me, in a sense, just by allowing me to be me in a media form and give me a kind of discipline that really led me to blog. And I think it made me a better blogger <clears throat> to this day which in turn has made me a better vlogger, right? Because I'm able to think about what I'm saying in paragraphs, express them in, I would hope, a simple way uh, for you that that is informative and, you know, entertaining. Um, I am not, and I've never been a journalist. I'm a person who is a child of the internet who believes, and I think the belief this may have been part of our rub. Chris, you know, in fairness to Chris, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Uh, Chris was all about helping tell the African-American story as a white person, okay? I want to get that out of the way. I think the difference is that you have a person who is not black and is not married to someone black so they don't feel the entire negative weight of the black experience in America, all right? But then that person is overseeing one who is living the black experience, everything from being ostracized at parties by people who, you know, you think, hey, I, I work with that person, they should talk with me and everything else, and they don't. And it took me a while to realize, hey, that's, that's racism, okay? as opposed to that person being a jerk. That's, that is racism, because they would talk to other people. Um, but those are things you really can't write about then. Blogging changed that. You could blog about that, and I would blog about that, but not the Montclarian, it's a different story. There was a restraint there that at times I felt was confining because I didn't know how to express myself within those confines. And it was also before video. Um, I did the best I could within that environment though. In fact, by all accounts, I think I did a pretty good job, but I did that because of Chris. You know, I did that because of Chris. So I'm sorry that our relationship never fully repaired 
Um, we never had a crossword with each other. I think it was more that the direction I headed in, primarily because of the person he built. And I say it just like that. But the person he built went internet. Blogger, video blogger, pioneer, okay? And, but I think if I had reached out to him and I said, hey, you know what, let's have lunch, I want to just thank you, he'd have, we'd have met. So that's on me that I didn't do that. And I, it's not that I didn't do it because I didn't want to. I just got so busy with my life. And of course, you know, he didn't reach out and say, hey, is anyone you want to talk about the Super Bowl or anything like that, right? Um, that it just became something that um, was in my past. But there wasn't a day that went by that at some point during that day, I didn't think about how much fun I had working with Chris, you know? So uh, that's, that's where it all started. Yeah, it went off from there and I, he's passed away at 66 years old. He's too young, he's way too young. So uh, God bless you, Chris. And uh, hey, thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. Subscribe to Zenny62, and well, you know, I don't even feel like saying it right now. I'll see you.